Good day, race fans. I'm on silent, and we're on the air with the Formula One Drive Through Podcast. It's episode four of the F1 Drive Through, right after round number four of the Formula One World Championship, the Russian Grand Prix. Not the most exciting race ever. It looked like it was going to build to a crescendo at the end, and then traffic got in the way. Not that I was rating anyone's chances of getting past that Mercedes engine of Valtteri Bottas, who won his first career Formula One Grand Prix today, gets in the fastest car on the grid and wins a race. You had to do that at some point, son, but good on you for doing it. Valtteri Bottas won his first Formula One Grand Prix today, and we will talk about that briefly because it wasn't a particularly exciting race, as I mentioned. Other than the start, I don't think there was a really on-track racing pass the entire Grand Prix. So uh, we will have lots to talk about other than the race. So let's take a look at your topics for today's episode of the F1 Drive Through. As always, they're going to be on the screen here, but don't forget to check the description down below. I don't think I mentioned that enough. Check the description down below, and you've got topics and timestamps. If there's something you really want to hear about, then click on the timestamp, and it'll jump you head straight ahead. So you can skip this and go straight to the Russian GP recap. That's first up on the list. Then I'll be talking about the 2018 F1 rules changes. The uh, F1 strategy group has announced some rules that still need to be ratified by the FIA World Motorsport Council, but that's generally just a formality. Sauber announced that they will be switching to Honda engines for 2018. We already knew about that for the last six months, but it's finally announced. And this leads to more McLaren and Honda drama, and we will also be talking about the revival of the Grand Prix of America. Not the United States Grand Prix in Austin, but a different Grand Prix of America that they've been talking about for the last six years and hasn't happened. But first, let's start with the recap of the 2017 VTB Russian Grand Prix won by Valtteri Bottas. Let's take a look at the race results. It was Bottas in first, followed closely by Sebastian Vettel, though it certainly didn't look that way for most of the race. Kimi Raikkonen was third. Lewis Hamilton finished fourth. A very Let's get Lewis's race out of the way right now. Heard nothing from him. He closed in on Raikkonen for a little bit in the early part, and then his tires started overheating, and they just he just kept following back and back and back and was a non-factor this entire weekend. Max Verstappen in fifth. The two Force Indias, Perez and Esteban Ocon, in positions sixth and seventh respectively. That Force India did have an upgrade coming into Russia, so it looks like it's paid off now. They actually both started in the top 10. They both made Q3 for the first time, and now they've both scored double points again. I mean, they've scored double points every other race, but they've scored double points again. So the Force India has good race pace, but they're finally, finally looking like they're a little bit faster than the rest of the midfield. Probably, well, I mean, obviously, when you go look at the constructor's standings, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but they're sitting P4, comfortable P4 ahead of Williams. But uh, you were kind of expecting them to be there anyway, but now they're actually kind of starting to authoritatively confirm that, yeah, they're the fourth best team on the grid right now. Felipe Massa, old Phil Massa in P number nine. You'll see on the screen he has uh, three sets of tires. He had to make a second pit stop for a slow deflating tire. So they had to get him in and switch on to a set of ultra softs just to close out the race. Otherwise, he would have had uh, P6 locked up instead of it being uh, Perez's finishing position. And uh, Carlos Sainz rounded out the points in position number 10 for Toro Rosso. Also of note, Lance Stroll finished a race. He probably, probably could have finished in the points if he didn't spin just as the safety car came out on lap number one. So let's take a look at the race. Let's go through it. Race start. It was the Ferraris, Vettel and Raikkonen locking out the front row for the first time since 2008. I believe they said it was the French Grand Prix of 2008. That was the last time we had a Ferrari front row lockout. But off the lights, they were both overtaken by Valtteri Bottas. A good start by Bottas and the use of the slipstream and that Mercedes engine got him by and into the lead and the race was over. I, uh, okay, the race wasn't over, but I mean, functionally, the race was over. It was a good start. It was looking really dicey into that first turn. Like, the Red Bulls looked like they could have done something. Hamilton looked like he could have done something. 
Hell, Raikkonen looked like he could have jumped up into second, but as it sorted out, everybody just kind of held station other than Bottas, who made the leap from third to first. In behind them, chaos and destruction, as uh, Julian Palmer and Roman Grosjean got together. Uh, and the Both guys were throwing blame at each other. It's a racing deal. Palmer was pinched in by a Sauber on his outside. Grosjean was, you know, stuck going up the inside, kind of hopped the curb. Palmer had nowhere else to go. So it's just like everybody was trying to get into one little tiny piece of real estate and a crash happened. That happens on starts. You know what? It was a bit of a spectacular crash. You see the little uh, screenshot there of Grosjean catching some air. After punting Palmer, Palmer spun, came back across, hit uh, Grosjean in his left rear and popped Grosjean up into the air. If you go back to the first episode of the series, I talk about changing the seating position to avoid back injuries. That jump in the air and landing on the ground and bumping into the wall like Grosjean did, that's what a better seating position is going to help him with because if Grosjean's got a sore back after that, it wouldn't surprise anyone because that's the those reclined seating positions. That's what happens when you get a big load going through your back because you're going from like, you know, a foot, a foot and a half in the air and slamming back down on the ground. That's going to go all through your spine. That brought out the safety car while they cleaned those cars up. It was out for four laps and brakes restart in lap five. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I can't believe I forgot this. So if you're looking at the results, you see, okay, Grosjean Palmer Alonso is the next one up and not classified as 18th. Well, I think that's a bit unfair to Palmer and Grosjean because at least they took the start. On the first formation lap, Alonso's car broke down as they were approaching the grid. Probably an Urs failure. We haven't heard yet. I'm recording this, you know, about a half hour after the race ended. So as a result, Alonso was out there to run second safety car lap, which is why it says lap 52 of 53 on the top of your screen there. They didn't run 53 laps, they ran 52. They had they deleted the 53rd lap from the race because of the extra formation lap. On the restart, it didn't take very long before Daniel Ricciardo's race ended. Not really anything of his own doing. His brakes overheated and they just retired his car after, I think he completed five laps officially. Bad luck for Daniel, but such is life. Or Sochi is life. No, well, I mean, they're trying to make Sochi a meme with the... Thank you, Sochi. It's not going to be well done, Baku. So, you know. But yeah, from there, the race sort of settled in. Long gap strung out. Uh, before the race, Christian Horner said that you're going to get turbulence within like five seconds of another car there. So it was hard to follow. And that was kind of where they strung out to after a while. Was everybody was kind of five seconds apart from each other. And then in the second half of the race, uh, Vettel closed in. He stopped eight laps later after Bottas, so he had slightly fresher tires. Bottas locked up his tires a couple times, wore him down pretty good. But uh, looking at some of the splits over the course of the race, the Mercedes power would have probably been too much to overcome for the Ferrari. But Vettel's fresher tires did allow him to get closed in on Bottas late in the going. But traffic seemed to foil Vettel's attempt to get by Bottas. The traffic was reasonably quick in getting out of Bottas's way. And, oh, there's another car about a second, less than a second behind him. I got to get out of his way, too. At the very end, old Phil Massa, whether intentional or not, balked Vettel for uh, the benefit of his former teammate at Williams. And that uh, gave Bottas a free and clear run to the line. That was That was the race, basically right there. I mean, we could complain about there being no on-track action. I mean, there's an anticipation of the pass that we had with Vettel closing in. Never came to fruition, which was a little exciting. I mean, you want that action. You want that drama, right? And, you know, just easy DRS passes aren't it. But, you know, okay, he's closing it. He's closing in. Can he get close enough to make a move? No. There was a little drama there, but a little excitement, but, you know, it kind of didn't pay off. There wasn't even close enough for Vettel to even look to make a move. And if he had, you know, I would get, I would rate Bottas a little higher for this race. But he just, you know, he was out front. But, you know, he won. Fair play to Bottas. First career Formula One win, as I mentioned. Not much of a race, as I said. I mean, let's be honest. We are only in Russia to validate a repressive regime. I'm not going to be allowed to go to Russia anytime soon for saying that, but you know what? I wasn't planning to go to Russia anytime soon anyway. So, but I mean, no, that's it. You know, you, it's the same thing with the Olympics. That's why they were there. It's just a, Hey, we're Russia. We're wonderful. 
just ignore everything that's going along, you know, ignore us killing the dog so we could build the uh, Olympic Park here in Sochi, ignore us saying that, you know, homosexuals are sexual deviants, and that uh, basically state-sanctioned homophobia, ignore all of the dead opposition politicians, you know, little, little things like, just ignore that, we got an F1 race, we got the Olympics, it's good. I try not to get political too much, but if you've watched my other videos, you know it does tend to slip through, but I think that's enough of a race recap. Not that there was much race to recap, so let's take a look at the standings. It's Vettel on 86 points from Lewis Hamilton, stretching out his lead by another 6 points. Bottas with his win vaults up ahead of Raikkonen for position number 3. It's on down Raikkonen, Verstappen, Ricardo with his DNF now level with Perez in position 6. And then Massa, Sainz, and Ocon. Alright, let's get on to more exciting things. 2018 regulations are starting to take shape. As we have been talking about for the last little bit, F1 is going to ban the shark fins and T-wings. They're going to be regulated out of F1 starting next season because F1 works in really weird ways. You've got these boxes, these fictional boxes where you cannot use or cannot put bodywork, and they're just going to amend where those boxes are so you can't put something in with the space where the shark fin is. So you're not going to have those big sails or shark fins. You're going to have like a, a little edge off the cover of the engine, most likely. But you're not going to have like that big old sail coming off the back of the engine cover either. F1 did say they were going to get some head protection or driver head protection on the cars for 2018. As I mentioned last week, you've got your halo, you've got your arrow screen, and you've got the shield that was introduced in China. And it looks like the strategy group has selected the shield to go forward. Drivers are still mixed on it. They're worried about vis visibility. We know that it's not going to deflect large pieces of debris, but it may be able to deflect smaller bits of carbon fiber and whatnot from hitting the driver. We are going to see them test it on track at Monza in Singapore before they give it the absolute final go-ahead to go in for 2018. But that looks like the direction F1 is going. Formula 1 is determined to spend more on their clutches, the strategy group has put forward a rule that requires standing starts following red flags during races. They keep trying to add more standing starts. We've got the standing start rule for wet races that came in this season. There was the on and off rule about standing starts after safety cars. And now it's going to be standing starts after red flags. So that's going to be a little more money spent on clutches to try and keep them from melting because you may have more than one start. You're likely to have more than one start at some point during the season. So you've got to get, you know, a clutch that can last, you know, two or three proper starts in the back of those cars. It's a little more money to develop the clutches. There's probably a little more weight in the back of the car as well. And we have the Mercedes rule coming in. The uh, strategy group has added a couple of rules for next season that's going to make it very hard for a team like Mercedes to put oil into the uh, combustion chamber to boost performance in qualifying. Teams will be required to feel, feed their oil level data to the FIA at all times during a race weekend. So the FIA sees the data and it's not like, hmm, your oil tank level is going down awful quickly in Q3, and what does that mean? And You're only allowed to have one engine oil specification per weekend, so you can't run like the special boost formula in qualifying and then a durable race formula in the race. And there's going to be a ban on valves that feed oil through the air, air intake, which is how they're getting it into the engine combustion chamber. They aren't feeding in with the fuel, they're feeding it in through the air intake, which is clever, a way around all the fuel restrictions. It's like, oh, the oil's going to come in through the uh, air intake, which I have to assume, if they're making that rule, somebody already knows that that's happening. So <laughs> I guess, well, I guess if, you, if it works in the rules, why not? So that's going to be how F1 is going to regulate out Mercedes qualifying oil boost We'll see how much of a difference it makes. We see that, you know, they aren't as good on race pace as they are on single lap pace, obviously, and especially as the tires get harder, as you saw with this race. On the Super Softs, it was all Ferrari, but on the Ultra Softs, it was all, it was all Bottas. I can't say it was all Mercedes, but it was definitely all Bottas. One rule that's coming in that does not have to do with 2018 is car identification. 
Now, right now, the only way that you can identify the different cars in a team is, one, if you can tell the helmets apart, and two, if you know which driver is the first or second driver, because the second driver has a couple of yellow stripes on the T-cam above the air intake. Now, they've made a couple of identification changes. One, the driver's car number has to be at least 23 centimeters high and 4 centimeters wide. That's about 9 inches and about an inch and three quarters and it has to be visible looking at from the front of the car so you look at the mercedes here and you know the numbers are up on top of the car right they're up right in front of the cockpit whereas if you look at the ferrari okay it's a little farther down you can see the number if you're looking at the car from the front i assume this is like if you're looking at it from the front you can pick it up on tv a little easier also the driver's name or their three letter name code must be put on either the top of the rear ring end plate or on the rear part of the air box so that it can be read from the side. And that has to be at least 15 centimeters or six inches if you're using Imperial, 15 centimeters high. So for someone like, you know, Kimi Reitgenen, you know, yeah, okay, you're going to use RAI. You're not going to write out the whole of Reitgenen, especially if you have to have it six inches high. The problem with that is, is that Force India says like, for them to do that, they're giving up a spot they could sell for $6 million a season. Teams are already crying poor. The FIA is demanding they see valuable sponsorship space to driver identification because they don't want to actually put in a real solution. They want a quick fix, but they don't really want to do anything that requires an um, overhaul of their rules. Because the biggest problem the FIA has is that the cars have to be identical with like the minor exceptions of like you can have numbers, driver names, the yellow highlighting on the T-cam, but that's the only things you're allowed to have different. And so you've restricted them so much in driver identification that it makes it pretty damn hard to pick out which driver is which. And so you need to know, because of the T-cam thing, you need to know which driver is the second driver. I mean, it's logical for most, most teams, right? But like, you know, Toro Rosso, it's Carlos Sainz that's running the yellow T-cam. And I wouldn't call Carlos Sainz the second driver at Toro Rosso, for example. I think it's time the FIA opened up the rules on livery. You can have them have the same color scheme fundamentally, but allow a couple of different colored sections. And I look at IndyCar as an example. Saturday night, IndyCar ran the Oval at Phoenix. And the Ed Carpenter Racing 2021 cars are both sponsored by Fuzzy's Vodka, and they're both predominantly green. But see, the difference between them is the 20 runs, you know, green front wing and green rear wing. Okay, these Pictures are a bad example because they've got fluorescent red and yellow stripes to help identify them. But the 21 of J.R. Hildebrand had a gold front and rear wing main element. So why can't we allow that on Formula One cars? Why not let them have, you know, different color sections like different colored main planes and end plates for the front and rear wings. Different colored mirrors, different colored barge boards. It's not much, but it's enough to be able to tell like, you know, like the Ferrari. Oh, Seb's running all red on his front wing and his rear wing and his mirrors and barge boards. And oh, Kimmy's running the white rear wing and the white mirrors and the white front wing. Boom, you can tell them apart quite quickly as a result. That would make it a lot better than big, ugly numbers. Not that I have a problem with that. I have more of a problem with the name being big on there. It'd be nice if, you know, they mandated that the number was visible on the side of the car as opposed to the name. The number will take up less space. Just put the number in a spot where it's visible at the top of the rear wing end plate. Boom, done, easy. No, F1 has to make it complicated. And I think they need to overhaul the paint scheme rules or delivery rules, as it were. So let's move on. Speaking of teams with numbers on the sides of their car, how about Sauber? That was a shitty segue, but deal with it. Sauber, as has been rumored for at least six months, is finally confirming that they will be switching to Honda power units for 2018. Yeah, okay, it's not a surprise. Honda's been looking for a new engine partner for a couple of seasons, and it looks like they've finally now been able to get a second engine deal now that uh, Ron Dennis has left the helm of McLaren, and it looks like they're going with Sauber. As part of the deal, McLaren will be supplying gearbox to Sauber. They currently get their gearbox from Ferrari, so rather than adding even more expense to Sauber, they'll just you know buy it from McLaren. Despite Honda's insane reliability problems, as Fernando Alonso will tell you, and Stoffel Van Dorn, who already had a 15-place grid penalty this weekend, even with their reliability problems, going to a new engine, not one that's kind of frozen to last year's finishing spec, is a step up for Sauber, just so long as the reliability thing finally gets worked out. Lots of Honda news this week, actually. 
Alonso Edis did not start today and wasn't particularly happy about it, but he's not the only one who isn't happy with the current state of Honda. The FIA and the F1 strategy group are looking to help Honda get their engine on par with the rest of the field. In their search for engine parity, the FIA took data from the first three races and ran some simulators and saw where the engine sat next to each other. And they found that the Mercedes and the Ferrari and the Renault engines were all pretty on par with each other in their simulations. Pretty on par being within three tenths of a second in a simulated lap of the circuit to Catalonia, Barcelona. And it appears that the only engine that did not meet the threshold was the Honda engine. So as such, the FIA is going to get the strategy group involved with trying to devise a plan to catch Honda up. So not only are they not reliable, but the Honda engine is also enough down on power that the FIA feels it has to intervene to make sure that there is some parity with their four engine manufacturers. As I mentioned, Mario Illen of Vilmar Engineering was drafted in by McLaren to help Honda, and Mercedes engineers have been seen hanging around the McLaren garage and appear to be helping the Honda engineers. Nobody's really come out and explicitly said that, but it appears that Mercedes has also been drafted in to help Honda figure out what it can do with its reliability and its power deficits. So all this comes hot on the heels of the latest Eddie Jordan video. Eddie uh, works for Channel 4 Formula 1 now. And uh, on Saturday, the Oracle of F1 spoke from upon high in his segment on Channel 4. Eddie said that he expects McLaren to drop the Honda engine in favor of a customer's Mercedes deal starting in 2018. Tell us something we don't know, Eddie. Oh, okay. They explored doing this over the summer break, but decided to hold off until next season. Now, Eddie's pretty good about being right about these things, so expect there's some truth to this. Eddie's pretty good at figuring out who's going where and what's happening in the F1 paddock, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's right. After all, his video Saturday also said Sauber was going to link up with Honda, and then the very next day, today, official announcement, Sauber Honda starting 2018. That's not to say that Eddie isn't kind of maybe front-running on rumors. Because, for example, he said that Alonso's going to leave McLaren and go to Renault. Well, we've been talking about that the last couple of weeks as a rumor. And since we've been talking about Alonso and Honda, Fernando was in Alabama last weekend and then in Indianapolis last week as part of his preparations for May's Indianapolis 500-mile race. He did a press conference at Barber Motorsports Park along with various media interviews uh, he watched the race from the pits and the uh, NBC Sports Network booth where he was talking with Lee Diffie uh, and Indy 500 veterans Townsend Bell and Paul Tracy. He uh, also went for a visit to Andretti Autosports headquarters in Indianapolis. He did the seat fitting. He used the Honda simulator in order to get a little Indy practice in, although his team owner, Michael Andretti, isn't as keen on as intense simulator work as you would do in Formula One, but that's okay because Alonso's private test is scheduled for the Indy Motor Speedway this week, and we will be talking about that in the next episode when we talk about the Spanish Grand Prix. And that brings us to the final topic for today. Just when you're confused enough about the schedule for 2018, 2019, so on, and other rumors just making the calendar even more crowded. German racing publication Amos, I believe it's Auto Motor und Sport. I think. Amos says that negotiations have reopened for the addition of the Grand Prix of America in New Jersey. Now, this was a street race that was first announced back in 2011, before a number of financial, contractual, and construction issues forced repeated postponement of the race until it was just dropped from even the provisional calendar altogether. Now, reports say that Liberty Media, who is the American commercial rights holder of Formula One, American the key word there, they're looking at reviving the race. The proposed track runs through the streets of Weehawken in West New York, New Jersey, which has the Manhattan skyline in the background. It's not a race through New York. It's kind of like Albert Park in the same way, and that's like, yeah, it's in Melbourne, but the real heart of Melbourne is kind of in those distant shots in the background where you can see like uh, Eureka Tower in Melbourne, for example. And the idea is with this track running through the uh, Imperial Port in New Jersey, that you can see the Manhattan skyline in the background. There's t actually talking about this being even a night race, so you can see the New York skyline and the Manhattan skyline all lit up at night. Now, it's not surprising that Liberty Media has kind of got some feelers out to a bunch of different American promoters and cities and racetracks to get a second race in America. It's kind of one of those things that we've kind of heard is one of their top priorities. They've talked about, uh, doing a race on the Las Vegas Strip or near the Las Vegas Strip. Presumably, if they're going to do the Strip, they're going to want to do it as a night race, which would be good for 
bloody anyone unless they run it like in March right after uh, Australia. So that way you could like start the race, you know, seven o'clock Pacific and have it under the lights. It's seven o'clock Pacific. It would be about 10 Eastern and that would put about two British standard time. So yeah, if it's a night race and you'd want it to be a night race, if you're doing the Vegas strip, it's not going to be spectacular for anyone. So, and then uh, you've got uh, Long Beach, whose city council is launching an investigation with a consultant as to whether they should pursue a Formula One race when their current IndyCar deal expires. But they need to lengthen the track, repave the track, probably change up all the barriers and the runoff, and add permanent pit facilities. Is it really worth the expense? On top of the rights fees that they would have to pay to go for Formula One. So I think Long Beach is the least likely option. If they're going to add a second race in America, I would say, you know, it's probably a toss up between the uh, New Jersey race and the Las Vegas race. I know we're going to get a second American race at some point, but where it will be and how they'll be able to wedge it in the calendar is the remaining question. But That is a question that will have to be left for another time because that is it for this episode of the Formula One Drive-Thru Podcast. Thanks very much for joining me as we continue our journey through Formula One. And if you like this, don't forget to check out in the top right of the screen, we also have the Grand Prix 2 Let's Play, which looks at the 1994 Formula One season. It's just, just a little video game bit. It's also a little history lesson about Formula One and how far we've come in Formula One in the last 23 years. So thanks very much for joining me for the F1 drive through. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you're new. Share on social media. Follow on social media. The social media handle is Unsilent on Air, and that's for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. And until next time, I'm Unsilent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next time. <laughs>